All right. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for this talk in honor of Native American Heritage Month, uh, sponsored by the Department of History and Political Science here at Texas A&M University, Texarkana. We're very happy to welcome back uh, one of our former students, Dr. Dale Weeks, who has recently completed his PhD at Texas A&M University down in College Station, and is working on a book on Chief John Ross called, there we go, Cherokee Civil Warrior, which should be out spring of 23. That's the idea. So I'll step out of the way and let uh, Dr. Weeks guide us through. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for, um, first off, for letting me come home, although telling Merritt on the way up, my wife Merritt, that this is home, kind of. Home for me was the other campus mm. on Robinson Road, but the people here, uh, it's been great to get to hug some people I haven't seen uh, in quite a while, people who mean a whole lot to me. So thank you all for being here. I do wanna, I will just jump right in. Um, I'm, I have this, kind of rule in class when I teach that if you, if you, the more you talk, the less I talk. I know Dr. Perry didn't have that same rule. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if you have questions, raise a hand, throw a cookie. Um, just if you're at Zoom, it might just be easier just to speak out. I'll try, I'll, I'll do my best to, to monitor. Um, but, if, if there's something that interests you, do you want clarification on or whatever, I, you're not going to bother me stopping me midstream. Okay, so certainly participate and get what it helps or what clarity you like. Or if you have a, a statement or a comment you want to make to participate, that's also fine. Uh, my book is under contract with the University of Oklahoma Press. Um, it was also my dissertation at Texas A&M. Cherokee Civil War, Chief John Ross and Tribal Sovereignty during the Civil War. That's OU Press's title. My dissertation title is considerably longer and far more descriptive. Uh, this is the this is the one they don't have to spend as much ink on when they when they actually print the thing. So if this works, this is this is what it's about. It's about Chief John Ross, who's the Cherokee uh, principal chief for a number of years. I'll go ahead and get. I, I, I was turning to do that. Um, I have learned to look at the admin <laughs> button on the screen. Oh, yeah. uh, as uh, Dr. Nication said, I did finish my PhD uh, last December in at Texas A&M University in College Station. That's after I finished my uh, bachelor's degree and my master's degree here at Texas A&M, Texarkana. With Dr. Perry, Dr. Waggy, um, I would like to say shaped me into the person I am now. Uh, uh, certainly gave me the foundation that I needed um, to, to, for me to be able to go into an environment like College Station and, and to succeed and to do well. And I, I, I'll never be able to thank you all for what you did. So thank you. I know Dr. Waggy will hear this in recording. Uh, I told him I'd talk about him, so I will. Um, let me go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've also learned that one. I, I get wound up going and then I have to backtrack. Let's talk a little bit about, I wanted to introduce you to the main characters in the book. If you're not familiar with John Ross, uh, he was the principal chief. And they say principal chief because Native American tribes often had chiefs, head men of smaller communities, towns, however, whatever terminology they used. But John Ross became the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation in 1828 and served until his death in 1866 for 38 years. Um, he was the leader. And he's, he's important to historians simply because he was so very well educated uh, that he left a mountain of written material, two, vo two volumes of just correspondence with family, uh, with the United States government, United States Army, with other Indian leaders. Um, and so that's pretty much where a lot of where this kind of started is just going through John Ross's communication. We'll get to you later, Andrew. Um, and it, it's, just, it's, just, it's just a different perspective because he's able to give us the Native American perspective in a form that is really kind of uncommon for lots in the 19th century. There are other Native American 
leaders who were also educated, who did do a number of writing, but for him to lead the Cherokee Nation during the period of the Trail of Tears all the way through the Civil War gives us lots of information. So he's a very important, um, very important person, obviously to, to my work, but to uh, what we do know about Native American history and uh, Indian policy in the 19th century. So I do deal obviously a lot with John Ross, but we also talk about this guy quite a bit in the book, Andrew Jackson was the sixth president of the United States. He was elected president of the United States one month after Ross was elected chief of the Cherokee. So they kind of grew up together. And, you know, rightfully so, we'll, we'll talk more about him shortly, but Andrew Jackson probably has the, the reputation of being the most unfriendly president we've had with Native American nations. Indian removal, we have Andrew Jackson, there's lots of calls around the nation for, you know, Jackson statues to be removed. Um, you know, in the book, I throw some other people in there. We, we forget that it wasn't Andrew Jackson that ordered the army to escort the Cherokees across the Trail of Tears. It was Martin Van Buren, his successor. So it, 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 Jackson was the leader, but it's a long, larger problem. So if you read the book, I'll explain that a lot better there. Uh, and then this guy, we, we did a lot with, Abraham Lincoln towards the end of Ross's career. Now, as John, as Andrew Jackson was probably one of our worst, if not arguably the worst president for U.S. Indian relations, Abraham Lincoln, in, in, as I will present him, is potentially one of the friendliest. We don't know a lot about his Indian policy simply because if you see the years of his presidency, he kind of coincide very closely to the Civil War. That kind of dominated most of his his time as president. He became president in March, and the Civil War began in April. And then he was assassinated just a handful of days after the surrender at Appomattox. So his his presidency was dominated by the Civil War. But he did, because of what we can do through John Ross, we can learn a lot about what his Indian policy. And he comes across as very friendly and very. Uh, tragic that he was assassinated before getting to fulfill a second term, which brought in this guy. And, uh, we do deal with Andrew Johnson in the book. Andrew Johnson uh, turned out to be very much, very unfair, I'll say, to the Native Americans, a lot of his policies. And, uh, of course, he has his own uh, problems with reconstruction and all. But the point is, John Ross had to deal with these these varying presidents. And it was just an up and down. Let me, let me get into it. I just want to introduce you to characters. Now let me kind of tell you a little bit about the storyline of where, uh, what I do with the book. First, I, I examine primarily the interaction between John Ross and the United States government. And by doing so, there's so much we can learn about both the Cherokee Nation and about U.S. Indian policy and even about uh, the president. I know, I know this is now the uh, the political science department has joined, which is fabulous. Um, if, you know, even a political science major could get a lot from this book just because of how I deal with the president. So I deal with tribal law, uh, constitutional law, tribal uh, sovereignty. But we learn a lot about that just by examining Ross's interaction with the governmental leaders. Um, also document how U.S. Indian policy developed through those years, from the Trail of Tears through the Civil War, John Ross had a big impact in that. And um, obviously there's the shortcomings. We have this idea, at least if you've read much history, you have the opinion perhaps that U.S. Indian policy in the 19th century was not something we should or have been or you know, should be proud of. And I do kind of talk a little bit about that and lay out some of what I think are the, are the bigger shortcomings. And we even try to define or to what would guide the, you know, kind of discuss the changing definition of tribal sovereignty during the 19th century. And for people like Ross, that was a frustrating ordeal. Okay. So those are the people. That's kind of what we do. And we do that mostly. I, I do that in the book by following uh, John Ross and his leadership of the Cherokee Nation. And as I said, he was the principal chief during the entire uh, Trail of Tears and removal ordeal in the 1830s. And he remained principal chief through the ordeal of the Civil War. So he's a very important, very unique character. 
And in the book, I kind of I, I try actually trace his leadership through both of those uh, events. And I see his, we, I, I kind of track his growth and what he learns about U.S. Indian policy and then how U.S. Indian policy at times benefits the Cherokee Nation and at other times greatly uh, fails the Cherokee Nation. All right, so let me start with talking about what I think are the big problems in the 19th century with U.S. Indian policy. This being uh, Native Heritage Month, this is what John Ross dealt with. I think the biggest problem, and this is, this is my opinion based on my research, the biggest problem is that U.S. Indian policy was never codified. There was never a set of law. Congress never actually said, this is Indian policy. This is how we're going to do it. This is what we are going to do. They left it instead to each individual president to kind of decide for themselves. Well, keep in mind who the first president was that John Ross dealt with, Andrew Jackson. So each president got to design Indian policy and Congress could and would occasionally grant power to the president. You know, in 1830, they did that. They voted to give the president the power to trade lands west of the Mississippi River for lands east of the Mississippi River, what historians call the Indian Removal Act. But Congress, for the most part, left it alone and let the presidents decide for themselves how to handle it. Each successive president got to add their part and take away their part problem is, is one promise made by one president could easily be dropped by the next one. And that too often happened to the Native Americans. Um, let me, let's, we'll take a moment. I, I, I struggled with where exactly I wanted to put this slide, where I wanted to talk about this. Um, and this seems to be the best place as the United States is trying to figure out its Indian policy. The Supreme Court was very heavily involved in that. And in this first Supreme Court case, I have just, uh, you know, the Worcester versus Georgia. That's, that's, a, that's a, to make the story, the long story very short, the Cherokee Nation was given land by a treaty that actually belonged in the state of Georgia. So the federal government gave Cherokee Nation Georgia land, and Georgia had a problem with that. And so that struggle for who had sovereignty over that, that land went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Cherokee Indians because of the treaty process. And so the Cherokee, John Ross particularly, following this decision, he knew that constitutional law favored them. And he knew that if he could just find the right, the right president or the right leaders who would who would follow constitutional law, then the Cherokee would be protected. Uh, but at this moment, when, when this ruling came down, Ross immediately stopped acting like a tribal chief, and he started acting more like what I would call a foreign dignitary in the fact of how simply he interacted with the federal government. Um, let me kind of put it, let me explain it this way. Uh, this is what the Indian Department look like. This is how Indian policy was kind of uh, structured during the 19th century. The president was at the very top. He made the decisions. Uh, the Secretary of War, or after 1849, the Secretary of the Interior took over. His, uh, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs was next under the Secretary. Then you had the, the superintendents and the agents who were out in the field on the ground. Well, after the Wooster decision, John Ross never dealt, or St. Denver, he rarely dealt with these uh, field agents again. He spent most of his time communicating directly with Washington. And as a, a, a tribal chief, that was frustrating to the Indian department because they wanted it to go through what they considered channels. And here was John Ross going over their head to Washington frequently. In fact, between 1828 and 1866, the Cherokee Nation had one chief, and here's where the problem lies. The fact that tribal, that uh, U.S. Indian policy was never structured created this issue. During that same period, from 1828 to 1866, again, the Cherokee had one chief. The United States had 11 presidents, and each one of them got to decide for themselves Indian policy. But of those 11, only six of them served a full term. And only two of those won re-election. Anybody happen to guess which two those were? 
I didn't know there was going to be tests. Did you? Well, the first one was, of all people, Andrew Jackson. And the, possibly the worst ever. And the, and the second one was Abraham Lincoln, possibly the friendliest, at least John Ross dealt with. So only two of the presidents were elected for a second term. And in those 38 years, only one president served the two full terms. And that was Andrew Jackson, possibly the worst one of the bunch to have done so in terms of Indian relations. So John Ross had to deal with this type of inconsistency, this type of turnover. What that meant is after, if you take Andrew Jackson's eight years out of the picture, take those eight years out, uh, between 1837 and 1866, the remaining 29 years, John Ross dealt with a new president every 2.9 years, and a new secretary every 2.1, and a new Indian commissioner every 2.4 years, constant turnover constant turmoil. And remember, the president is the one that got to come in and revamp Indian policy if that's what he chose, or ignore Indian policy if that's what he chose. So this is the, this is the tenure of John Ross. He's going from Andrew Jackson to now constant turnover. No, no footing, no security. You don't know from year to year what you can trust in Indian policy. And it's what I call just an absolute crippling inconsistency for the Native American. The United States doesn't see a problem with it, but the Native nations have to struggle with this. And there's no, there's no, there's no comfort, there's no security or stability in any of this. So that's the background that John Ross worked in. Uh, so this is how John Ross responded between 1832 and 1838. Uh, this is the years from the Wooster decision until the Trail of Tears. John Ross wrote to the President of the United States 12 times. He wrote to the Secretary of War 37 times, 14 times to the House and or Senate of the United States, but only three times to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. And then he even made the trip to Washington from, from Georgia, Tennessee area, made the trip six times in seven years to visit face to face with presidents and to speak directly to senators and representatives and to try to interact with the government in Washington. Or simply because he was trying to get stability and security. And in this particular case, he's trying to get Andrew Jackson taken care of so that, so that they could remain at home. Um, but also between 1840 and 1846, the first a uh, few years after their arrival in Indian territory, he still made five trips, 1,200 mile trips in those six years, five trips to Washington. Again, he didn't deal with the Indian department on the ground. He considered himself a foreign dignitary and he considered the Cherokee nation a sovereign nation who was negotiating power and sovereignty with another sovereign nation in Washington. And that's important for us to remember um, that even 1860, hang on, 1860 to 1866, during the Civil War, he made nine additional trips. Some of those were from Philadelphia later. If you read the book, you can kind of track all that. But John Ross spent his time dealing directly with the government of the United States on matters of Indian policy. Okay, how does that gonna affect you? All right, uh, the only, by the way, the only consistent aspect of US Indian policy during this time period was the treaties that they signed. Now, if you're not familiar with how the United, the United States dealt with Indian nations is through the treaty process. The treaty with, you know, the constitution gives the president the right to negotiate a treaty with whoever he wishes he or uh, I guess now he or she wishes, and then they take that treaty back to the Senate for ratification. Very simple process. Well, the Indian nations of the United States loved this treaty making process because it, it, in a sense, gave them this feeling of, okay, we are too a foreign nation. We have some sovereignty, we have some identity. So the treaty making process was something that the Indian nations clung to mostly because it was the one stability in all of this instability. As long as we have a treaty in place, we don't care what the rest of y'all are doing. 
All right. Does that make any sense? Read the book. I, I clear. I, I it's absolutely clear. All right. So let's let's now deal quickly. I'm, I'm, I'm setting the stage here to give you the storyline kind of that quickly. Uh, the Supreme Court did deal with tribal sovereignty, and and this is how this is. Um, there, there might be a test at the end of this too, by the way. Uh, maybe just a question because this this one this is one of those things where you know if I share this with with students at Glen College, at first they want to get uneasy, which is me. I want to get uneasy, but then at the end, you don't know what else to do. Okay, so let's follow the definition of tribal sovereignty from the Supreme Court in 1823 in Johnson versus McIntosh. Um, the United States, well, the Supreme, the uh, Chief Justice John Marshall put forth what has been called the Discoverer's Doctrine. The question was raised, who has the, who has the sovereignty over the land? Is it the Indians or the Europeans? Was it the Indians or the British? Who, who owns the land initially? Well, the Supreme Court took that up. And the Supreme Court decided that the, the country of the entity that owned the land was obviously the European discoverer. And their, their thinking was this, that if you were to walk into the middle of an Indian nation and you were to ask who owns the land, the Indian nation would say, nobody owns the land. Walk into the middle of a European city and says, who owns the land? And everybody in the room raises their hand. And worse is the other nations of the world will point to it and say, well, England owns that. <coughs> France owns that. And because of that dynamic, the Supreme Court says, naturally, then, the European discoverer owns the land. Huh. Well, then they dealt with it here in Worcester v. Georgia. Remember the struggle over who owned the land in Georgia? What happened is Georgia said, well, what about this discoverer's doctrine? You said it's ours, and now you're saying it's the Cherokee. And the Supreme Court reminded them that when you ratified the Constitution, you gave the United States certain authority. And part of that authority was to sign a treaty. And that treaty gave some of your land to the Cherokee. And so there was celebration throughout the Cherokee Nation because the Cherokee were, had sovereignty over that land shared with Georgia. Now, here's the big problem. In 1903, Lone Wolf, which is Hitchcock, the question of the security of tribal treaties came to the Supreme Court. If the United States abrogated this treaty, why isn't the treaty still in place? And the Supreme Court ruled in 1903 that because the United States is the supreme sovereign, they can abrogate a treaty whenever they wish with the Native Americans, simply because nobody steps up to stop them. And they have done so by this time for 100 years or more. And because of that, the Supreme Court ruled that the United States is supremely sovereign. And that was actually used in the 2020. That precedent was actually used to decide a case in July of 2020, McGirt v. Oklahoma. Uh, and I, I put this here just simply, and it, it, I, I kind of deal with this a little bit in the book too. This is a case where a Seminole Indian man named uh, Jim C. McGirt was convicted in 1997 of multiple counts of uh, sexual violence against a child and was sentenced to, come back, was sentenced to 500 years without parole. He was sentenced, a Seminole Indian man sentenced in district court in Oklahoma to 500 years. 20 years later, his lawyers filed a petition with the federal courts asking that that conviction be thrown out and that a new trial be granted in federal court. And they did so on the grounds that because McGirt was a Seminole Indian and the alleged crime took place in the Creek Nation, then the state of Oklahoma had no jurisdiction in Eastern Oklahoma. You can imagine what that meant to the folks in Oklahoma. Well, the Supreme Court ruled in his favor in July of 2020. 
long, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, you can, I touch on this briefly in the book, but get on Google this. This is, this is going to, 100 years worth of court cases in Oklahoma are now on the verge of being thrown out if they're Native Americans on Native American land. State of Oklahoma has no jurisdiction there. But the reason I put this here is because the Supreme Court ruled and they cited Lone Wolf v. Hitchcock saying the United States can abrogate the treaty will. But what they said is the United States has to do it intentionally and they have to say so. You can't just ignore it. You have to say publicly, this treaty is no longer in place or this is, it. it's a long, ugly process but who is, who is sovereign? Is the United States, do they have, do we, they, we have supreme sovereignty? I'm a historian. I'm just going to dig up what people have done in the past. You political science folks will handle this. This is tough. All right, so Indian policy itself is frustrating. And John Ross felt that for all these years. Following the Trail of Tears, this is what John Ross learned about U.S. Indian policy, is that Cherokee sovereignty only existed in the pages of the treaties with the United States. It existed nowhere else. If those treaties were gone, there was no, in, there was no sovereignty for the Cherokee Nation. So they had to do whatever possible to, um, to maintain that. I'm just letting random people in here. I guess that's okay. Um, the U.S. Constitution validates those treaties. A Senate ratified treaty is the supreme law of the land, according to the Constitution. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld those treaties in Worcester versus Georgia. And so for John Ross, protecting those treaties became paramount for him and the Cherokee Nation. The only place we have any security is in those treaties and the security of those treaties with the United States. Uh, and white politicians, I just had to throw this in there because this is his attitude. White politicians can rarely be trusted to honor those treaties. That's why he spent so much time in Washington trying to remind, and you can read his correspondence, trying to remind them of the United States' responsibilities to the tribe. This is the treaty we have. This is what your responsibility is and a constant reminder, a constant effort to protect the treaties just to protect tribal sovereignty for the Cherokees. Uh, thoughts, questions? I'm liable to say something brilliant at any point, so if you want me to stop and go back and say it again, I'll be glad to. Just, uh, did you have a question or you? No, go ahead right, right now. You might forget. Uh, I'm going to go back to Johnson and that's the that um, we look, you know, we always look at precedent in America, but um, the Spanish crown also claimed to own all the territory, right? And that everyone just worked it at its blessing at first. And then they said, if you wanted a title, you had to pay a very expensive fee to the crown. So it was yeah. And of course, all subsoil belonged to the crown too, all the gold silver. <laughs> Was this president, uh, did the Spanish kind of policy or other your other colonial power policy affect uh, come into the discussion in the case of Johnson versus McIntosh? Um, Johnson versus McIntosh, yes. Uh, they actually cited that in the in the case. The, as it cited everything from even the, the, the Pope's donation in 1493. The Spanish were given here, they gave it here, they had it here, they sold it here, they lost it here, they gave the, really didn't follow the process. And his point wasn't who owns it now. His point was, this is how European nations work. They make a claim, they disagree, they struggle, but at some point somebody says, you own that, I own this. And yeah, but they, they, they specifically, Johnson versus McIntosh, they specifically mentioned the Spanish crown and that whole process of how they claim the land or how they do not claim the land. And the, Cher and the point was that being that the Cherokee never claimed it. And all these European nations did, and then they struggled for years over who finally got control of it. And all this time, the Cherokee Indians, they, their idea of tribal, maybe this is a better, better way to explain. Did I answer that? The, the better way to explain is the Cherokee Indians didn't believe anybody owned the land. They held the land communal. That means all of us owned. And Cherokee, if, if you, Kevin, if you wanted to have a farm, 
and down by the river, there was 100 acres not being used. Those were yours to use, as long as Dr. Perry wasn't using, you know, the ones up, up the creek. You, you had free right to use it for however long you, need, you wanted to use it, for as much of it, as long as it didn't interfere with somebody else's. And when you got tired of that one, you could move the other side of the river, you could move up the hill, as long as there was an open space. Nobody owned it. By the way, that's one reason slavery developed so quickly in the, in the uh, well, I was You have a comment in the chat as well. Oh, mercy. I, was, yeah, I, think Dr. I do. Uh, let me try to turn up some volume here. Uh, repeat the questions from the audience. Could you read? Oh, the question. Yes, the question was, um, what was the question? <laughs> the question was, <laughs> the John the president of the Spanish Empire um, in the possession of land. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Um, the other thing is that the, I'll let follow up. Like, what was the, is, there was no Ajito. You remember what Ajito is, the common lamp yes. policy. Yes. Uh, uh, there was no equivalent in the, in the, in the English policy. I'm trying to find the volume button here. Yeah, it's on the wall. It's really. Oh, well, I'm going to stay away from the wall. The question pertained to the Johnston Johnson versus Macintosh um, ruling and whether the precedent of Spanish uh, land uh, secession, land ownership, came up, which it did. The 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 opinion. I don't remember. I guess it was Marshall that delivered the opinion gave just a, a long, and he specifically mentioned the Spanish, he specifically mentioned uh, the French and other European nations and how they each claimed land and the process they went through to claim their ownership of the land and how that differed from what the Cherokees did. And therefore the Europeans claiming to own it and the European world kind of agreeing to that process meant that the, that the Europeans owned basically all of it. Yeah, that actually, leads into my question, which is, um, we know that the Cherokee were probably the most assimilated of any of these groups. They really tried to sort of follow the rules. Um, we know that they themselves engaged in um, slave ownership and plant large scale plantation ownership. Um, but what I see here and what I see from Ross is that he seems to believe um, in the, the institutions of the United States. And to me, it feels like some sort of naivete to be expecting um, sort of justice from the courts uh, and, and maybe even um, not acknowledging the extent of white supremacy that's going on here behind the scenes. Um, were there yeah. other Native American leaders at the time who uh, would would think similarly who were um, sort of judging or um, commenting on Ross's belief in this system somehow coming to his aid, even though he's not a, a member of white of the white supremacy. Um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, each during that same time period, I know the the Choctaw and the Creek were dealing with their own removal issues, and so as far as coming to the aid. Um, Ross had a lot, there were a lot of, uh, I guess what we would call businessmen in the United States that came vocally to the aid of the Cherokees. The, each Indian nation was dealing with their own issue. But to your point, what made Ross and the Cherokees so unique is that they were so, and we, I say semi-acculturated. Um, the United States government asked them in 1791 John, uh, under George Washington, basically asked them listen, you're going to have to give up your ways. You're, you're roaming the nation, you're hunting, you're interacting too many times with white settlers and it's causing problems. We would like for you to be, this is a very uh, kind of scaled down version of the story. We would like for you to become subsistence farmers so that you're staying in place and you're becoming a part of society instead of an intrusion in society. And so the Cherokee's response to that was, okay, and they did, and they purposely, and they, they purposely gave up what they called the chase. And they purposely in 1817 established their first committee and soon afterwards the Supreme Court and in 1827 they adopted their own constitution. And in 1828 elected a chief, their constitution was a bicameral 
Okay, it was it was it was a model off of the United States Constitution, but they did everything the, the United States asked them to do. Yeah. And and there was one uh, time when a group of these leaders wrote to the um, oh, I'd have to go back and look to which governor I think it was the governor. You've asked us to become farmers, and we did. You asked us to become uh, civilized was the word, and we did. And now you're uncomfortable to have such a large civilized group on your border. Yeah, exactly. So we don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. So we became everything you wanted. And John Ross was heavily educated. Keep in mind, the Cherokee not only had a constitution, but if you remember back to your uh, elementary school social studies class, you probably learned about a guy named Sequoia. Sequoia came up with, developed a, an alphabet. I'm not talking using the English letters to put together. He created an alphabet, letters that you and I could look at, and we have no clue what the sounds are. And with a matter of years, the Cherokee Nation, uh, some historians argue, was more literate overall than the state of Georgia was. So this is a very unique nation. They very much identify with um, the process of constitutional law. They rely on it. But what really changed the game was that ruling in Wooster v. Georgia, when the Supreme Court says you are sovereign over your land. And to the Cherokee, that what else could happen? But the problem was Andrew Jackson refused to enforce it. Yeah. He took the side of the Cherokee, and before long, the Cherokee Nation was marching across the Trail of Tears to Indian Territory. Yeah, and I guess that's where my question comes, like sort of how much of this is their naivete in, in believing in, in sort of our system's uh, sort of core justice versus our country's commitment to white supremacy? Yeah, and I think it became, I think there was some naivete for sure, uh, based on the fact that, you know, we won the Supreme Court, you know, Supreme Court won in our favor now, Andrew Jackson's wanting to not do this, well, that Ross went immediately back to Washington and said, come on, you guys, you got to force it. Like you were going to take our side over. So there was some of that. And over time, I would, I would say probably the best way to describe it is Ross actually would become jaded when dealing with these leaders. Um, he would defend, he would, he would do whatever possible to position the tribe to, you know, we have to take care of this ourselves. We can't trust them. Even after the United States abrogated the treaties later, Ross told his people, that's on them. We still have to maintain as best we can because we can't trust them. Uh, so I think he, at, at first there was very much that, but I think over time that, that went away as Ross and the, and the Cherokee became more, you know, more aware that these, you know, these white politicians just couldn't be trusted. And that's where my book is, is interesting in the fact that John Ross met Abraham Lincoln, and this was a different story. Does that answer your question? I'll, I'll, where I come from, that, that well, A&M, that means all sorts of things. So we'll take that as a yes. All right, so let's go to the start of the Civil War, since the book, a lot of the book is the Civil War. And this is where the problem kind of came in. The United States, at the start of the war, if you remember the Civil War era, withdrew, you know, when the war started, the United States had about 16,000 or so um, federal regular forces scattered throughout the United States. And it seems natural to me. And when I first heard this in Dr. Waggy's class, I'm going, okay, yeah, I'll put that down. I'll remember that for death. That seems fair. You pull those forces in and get ready to distribute them elsewhere in the country because that's where they're needed. And so the United States had to pull them out of these posts in the West and bring them back into some sort of organization for redistribution. Problem is, three of those forts, Fort Washita, Fort Arbuckle, and Fort Cobb's a little slow there. Fort Cobb were all in Indian territory. So, well, when the United States pulled these, this, the troops out of these three forts, the Native nations viewed this as an abrogation of the federal treaties because the United States had promised when we give you, when we forced you over the Trail of Tears and put you in this new land, we promised to be there to protect you. And now the United States abandoned them. And John Ross caught it. 
the, the Creek Indians called it a, 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 um, a head man by the name of Apothle Ahola, if you've heard that name, wrote directly to, uh, to walk to Lincoln multiple times asking, almost demanding that the troops come back and you fulfill your treaty responsibilities. Uh, but here's where I think it gets interesting. General Winfield Scott, who was general of the army at the time, was the one that pulled the troops in. And I think he knew that this was going to be an issue in Indian territory. Let me explain it this way, and I, I bet you agree. First off, Winfield Scott was the army general who was sent into Georgia and Tennessee to arrest Cherokee families while they were eating dinner to put them in temporary holding pens to escort them across the Trail of Tears. It was Winfield Scott who, who did those arrests, and he, he really disliked to... He hated the fact that the Cherokees just resisted that. How are you resisting this? And he had a problem with that for some reason. So it was Winfield Scott that made the decision to abandon these three forts in Indian territory. And I argue that he knew this was going to be an issue for the Indians, simply of the way he had the order delivered. Now, any other order went out through Telegraph were available, the message went to whoever, and they sent a courier and delivered the message through normal channels. The message to send this, to take this one regiment out of Indian territory was given to a guy named, a, a corporal, a, excuse me, a Lieutenant Averill, was given to him personally in Washington, and he was to travel from Washington in plain clothes under an assumed name, and if you don't believe me, you can read it in the official records of the Civil War. Plain clothes under assumed name, hand these orders directly to the Lieutenant Colonel in Indian territory, and then to return to Washington immediately. One regiment in Indian territory was that valuable, but I believe that Winfield Scott knew this was going to be a controversial move. And that as he pulled these troops out of Indian territory, the Indians were going, and, and probably not just the Indians, were going to say something. And they did. Problem is, the Texans, you know how those Texans are, they find something open and they got to go get it. And Texans immediately moved in with a matter of, with, in some cases, a matter of hours, had taken these three forts and occupied Indian territory. Now the United States Army was gone, and the Confederate Army was in place. There went the treaties, right? And the Confederates began negotiating with the Indian tribes for an alliance immediately. Huh. So well, let's talk about the Civil War, because historians have written a lot about the Cherokee Nation and Civil War. And one thing that keeps coming up is the fact that there was slavery in the Cherokee Nation. There were, in fact, at best estimate that I can see, uh, these are history, other historians' estimates, but what seems to be the agreed upon number was 2,511 slaves in 1860 in, 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 in the Cherokee Nation alone. Well, that seems like a lot. And yes, slavery had over, had just overwhelmed the Cherokees, right? That's just the way we present it, it's the way almost we envision it. But if you take this percentage of the population, and compare it to the entire Cherokee population, it looks actually more like the state of Maryland would. When slavery was legal in Maryland, there was actually a higher percentage of, of the slave population in Maryland than there was in the Cherokee Nation. So it, it was there and it was present and it certainly had control of a lot of the leadership of the tribe, including John Ross, he did own slaves. Uh, I deal with this in the book, so you know we can take some time and talk about that if you want to have a cup of coffee or catch us as we're walking to the car. I don't care. Uh, or you can read the book. There's a good option. But slavery wasn't the reason that the Cherokee Nation entered the war. And so this is what historians op often say. John Ross actually opted for neutrality. When the war started, he backed off and said, this isn't our fight. We're not going to play. And historians have said what he's doing is he's loyal to the United States. He's remaining loyal to the United States. He's remaining loyal to the Union. And here's the question I want to ask. Was John Ross loyal to the United States? 
And, and uh, Laura, I think this will speak to your uh, naivete. naivete. I'm from East Texas. I can't say that word. He was gullible. Okay. Does this answer that? This I think this will answer that. Was he loyal to the United States? Was he gullible enough to be loyal to them? Here's my response. Really? The way they have treated him, the way they treated the, not just the Cherokee Indians, but the Native nations, he knew better. His loyalty was never with the Union. It was never with the United States. It was always with the treaty. He was loyal to the East. He expressly said so. And sometimes, somehow, historians have missed that mark. If you're not Confederate, you must be Union, right? He was loyal to the treaties, and that's important. So the war started, and secession started. Here's where the problem was. John Ross was, was uh, neutral. Texas wasn't. Neither was Arkansas. Neither were the Creek Indians, the Choctaw Indians, the Chickasaw Indians, and every other tribe in Indian territory. All signed, took, became Confederate. The Cherokees were the only ones. In fact, there's a map. You can kind of envision that. That's a well-done map, isn't it? Dr. Waggy would be proud. He couldn't do anything near that. Here's Arkansas. That's, that's a Confederate state. Here's Texas as a Confederate state. Here is the, this is the, the Cherokee Nation. Well, here's the Creek Nation. That's Confederate. The Seminole Nation's Confederate. This all, everything around them is Confederate, except the Cherokee Nation. And if you go into these first two wars, two battles of the war, the First battle of Bull Run in July, this is in Virginia. The Confederates won the first battle. The second battle of the war in August in Wilson's Creek, this is in Southwest Missouri. This is just a few miles from the Cherokee Nation. And the Confederates won this one too. So the first two battles, first two significant battles of the war, the Confederates won them both. And so John Ross now is looking at that map and now it looks like Missouri's going with them. So it's Missouri and Arkansas and Texas and the Creeks and the Seminoles and the Choctaws and the Chickasaws. And now it's the Comanches and the Urep and whatever, whoever else, the, the um, Quapaws, the Cano, the, the list is this long of Indian nations that signed with the Confederacy and John Ross and the Cherokees were the last holdback. And he had a dilemma on his hands. Okay, can you read that? His options were to remain neutral. That's fine. If you remain neutral and the Confederates win, what happens? You become the only government in the South who's not a part of the Confederacy. You can actually read the book, and there's a great interaction between John Ross and Albert Pike during this time. Uh, but if he remains neutral and the United States wins, then nothing changes good for us. But at this point, remember, it doesn't look like the United States is winning. Two battles, both of them won by the Confederacy, plus the Confederacy has occupied Indian territory. This didn't look like a, 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 an option. And then his other option was a Confederate alliance. If we sign with the Confederacy and the Confederacy wins, then our treaties will just be guaranteed by a new white government. Albert Pike was, the, was a Rick was an agent from the Confederate state sent to Indian territory to secure these alliances. We are familiar with the name Albert Pike in this area. And what Albert Pike did is he knew the Indian nation in the mind, and he promised Ross, he said, if you sign a treaty with us, we will become the protector of you. We will become your treaty guarantor. We'll just replace the treaties with the United States. He knew where Ross's mind was. And so Ross knew that if the Confederates won, and we have a Confederate alliance, and our treaties are just simply with the new white government. Well, if we sign a Confederate alliance and the Union wins, then we're going to have to throw ourselves at the mercy of the United States and hope that they believe us that we had no option. So, but we running out of time here. What are we? We're up against four. Okay. I'll I'll do this quick. You know how quickly it can be. I'll do it as quick as Dr. Perry. <laughs> That's what 
Yeah. October 12th. No. Uh, October 12th, the United States. Well, I, let me go back here. I'm reading ahead. October 12th, 1861, the Cherokee Nation did agree to an alliance with the Confederate States. And historians stop right there. Cherokee Nation owned slaves. Cherokee Nation signed an agreement with the, with the Confederates. The Cherokee are pro Confederate. That's, that's absolutely wrong. They struggled with who to sign with. Their loyalty was to neither North or South. It was to the treaties. And John Ross had to decide which best path to navigate through the Civil War so that our treaties will be intact because it's our treaties only that give us sovereignty. Well, the United States abrogated the treaties by abandoning the three forts in May of 1861. And the Cherokees abandoned, abrogated the treaty by signing a new one with another government. So who, abandoned, who abrogated the treaties? This is going to be the question that dominates the story from here on. John Ross said the Cherokee, the United States abrogated the treaty. This guy agreed with him. Caleb Blood Smith at the time was Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of the Interior. And he said this the hostile attitude assumed by portions of the tribes referred to have resulted from the withdrawal from their vicinity of the troops of the United States, whose presence would have afforded a guarantee of protection. So the reason they signed with the Confederacy is because we abrogated the treaties. There we go. It is unfortunate the War Department has been unable to send to that region such body of troops as be adequate to the protection of those tribes and revive their confidence in the ability as well as the will of the United States to comply with their treaty stipulations. We have reason to believe that as soon as the United States shall reestablish their authority in the Indian country and shall send a sufficient force for the protection of the tribes, that they will renounce their connection with the rebel government and come back to the United States. November 30th, as the Secretary of the Interior. For time's sake, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs offered a very similar plea to Washington. They've thrown off their allegiance simply because of the position they were placed because we left. I have no doubt the president will be disposed on their return to treat them with a generous leniency also in November. So the United States government, Abraham Lincoln's administration realized what the United States had done to the Cherokee nation. And so on March 19th, 1862, Abraham Lincoln did what somehow history has missed. Yeah, they, they recognize the order, but this is where my book gets out. We talk about this to some degree, but never like this. Abraham Lincoln, this is the, the order, says, General, it is the desire of the president on the application of the Secretary of Interior and the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, that's Smith and Dole, that you should detail two regiments to act in the Indian country with a view to open the way and return to their homes and protect them there. Now, I'm gonna go back a second and we're gonna wrap this up as best we can. Look who this is. This, this letter, this order was delivered by Edwin M. Stanton to Henry Halleck. Edwin M. Stanton was the Secretary of War at the time. Henry Halleck was the commander of everything United States, I guess I don't even Missouri at this time, I guess, west of the Mississippi River, anywhere, St. Louis. He, he was perhaps at this point, maybe Lincoln's number two general, perhaps. This was, this was the Secretary of the War, one of the high up generals, and it was the president, the Secretary of the Interior, and the commission. All that's a lot of firepower to make one decision to remove two regiments in the Indian Territory. This wasn't, even the way, my, the way I presented is this was not a movement of the Civil War. This was not a movement of the Union Army. This was a movement of Indian policy, We're putting the treaties back where the treaties belong. And John Ross recognized that. Abraham Lincoln recognized that. Um, Abraham Lincoln, sent in July of 18, June and July of 1862, what we call the Indian Expedition, left Kansas and marched into Indian territory with the purpose of going, taking Fort Gibson. 
and bringing the United States Army back into the Indian Territory and restating, reinstating the treaties with the Native Americans. Uh, if we had about two, I tell you what, read the book. <laughs> I would advise it's fabulous. There's a man that we have not spoken of yet, a guy named Stan Wade. If you're familiar with that name. Stan Wade was a Cherokee Indian. In the 1930s, the United States Postal System, Postal Service, issued a stamp with his likeness because of how history has remembered the valiant Confederate general. When the Indian expedition marched into Indian territory to uh, re reinstate the Cherokee Nation, and reinstate the, the treaties with the Native Americans, the biggest enemy they had was a guy named Stan Wade. And if you read the book, or if we have a chance and we can talk, uh, I hope somebody in the United States Postal Service issues or reads the book. Because we should, anyway. Abraham Lincoln made the decision. John Ross was waiting. They, the Indian expedition ultimately, after some struggles, arrested John Ross, sent him to their commander, General Blunt in Kansas, who immediately after talking with Ross said, listen, you need to go to Washington. Ross, Blunt wrote a letter to Abraham Lincoln telling him, I sent him to you, introduced him. I, I, I believe you're going to see that his story is valid. And sent John Ross to Abraham Lincoln with a letter of introduction. Abraham Lincoln met with John Ross in 1862, and we think again in 1863. And John Ross was able to lay out the fact that we were here, we were loyal to the treaties, and we had no choice but to sign with the Confederacy. And from listening to the, putting the, the records together and the reports together, obviously Abraham Lincoln was busy doing other things. When John Ross was sitting in his office, Abraham Lincoln was days away from issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, he was, Robert E. Lee was actually days away, was on his way to Antietam, if you know where that is in the story there. And there was an Indian uprising taking place in, Missis in Minnesota all at the same time that John Ross is sitting here. So Abraham Lincoln has very little time to commit to this. But Ross and Caleb Smith and William Dole all come away with the belief that Lincoln believes you. And there was a letter later from one from a couple of Union generals who made the statement to each other randomly that says, you know, we've got to move this in Indian territory because the president wants Ross reinstated. And so Abraham Lincoln set out to up uh, to he admitted that the United States abrogated the treaty, the first president in this time to have openly done that and was preparing, trying to get the Cherokee Nation reinstated in Indian territory when this took place. And then the next president in, Andrew Johnson, had no intention of doing so. And again, for the sake of time, we'll, we'll end it there. Um, University of Oklahoma Press, it, it, I believe the, the strength of this book is that it tells an entirely different story of the events in Indian territory. It puts Abraham Lincoln on the center stage of Indian policy in ways that other historians haven't been able to do because by using John Ross, I'm able to get into the, the Oval Office in a way that other historians perhaps haven't been able to. And so this is a, that's an important book. Um, thank you for letting me come uh, share uh, about it. If you have any questions, I'd love to hang around or uh, bring however you want to handle that. Well, let's say uh, thank you first. Hold on. Possibly a question on Zoom. Well, that's what is the, where's the Zoom? Oh, guy? now Laura has to said she was just saying that it was great and heading off. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, I guess, end the uh, recording. And then if we want to stick around, we can. We can chat with Dale. I don't know if he's going anywhere. I will say if there's anyone on Zoom who wants to ask a question before we go, not all at once, just, you know, one of the, yeah, okay. Just 
wowed into into a stupor of See, if you there do it go. right the first time they don't have the that's exactly yeah it was, it was so clear there is no need for questions i love it uh, all right well thank you very much folks uh we appreciate it and uh they will stick around to answer any questions that anyone in the room has so um thank you and take care